uh, and it's very good to uh, be at the Sheffield Buddhist Centre. Again, I came on Thursday and I've had a very, uh, very full and rich uh, time uh, here uh, in the, 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 uh, the day the day since, uh, seeing many people uh, doing lots of uh, study groups, giving talks, participating in that wonderful ritual we had on Sunday evening where we formally, uh, Maitri Dasa formally handed over the chair to Satya Jyoti. So Satya Jyoti is now our, our chair our person, uh, wonderfully. Uh, it's a very, very rich, uh, very, very rich time indeed. And um, uh, in a way, Vidanya's, Vidanya's introduction to this, this whole theme of the new society, I, I feel like all I need to say to you is that you're sitting in it. In a way, giving a talk on it is sort of slightly, it feels slightly redundant because the there is this incredibly con wonderful space, uh, converted Catholic um, convent and church transformed into a Buddhist centre, um, thoroughly Buddhist, uh, a whole environment uh, which is just supportive of a Buddhist practice. That's essentially what a, a new Buddhist society is. It's a, an environment in which all of the conditions are conducive to your individual transformation and development all the way to uh, enlightenment. That's, that's what it is. And we have these Buddhist centres, these sorts of environments, just for that. Uh, so it's uh, obviously we want that to sort of spread out more and more widely. So in a way, talking about it uh, might distract from the actual reality, the actual experience. I know many people who've told me, even a, a member, a very senior order member um, involved in the centre came to see me one day and she was then working in the NHS. She, she, she'd been working in the NHS for decades and the NHS was going through all sorts of cuts and changes and she was finding the atmosphere really quite toxic. And she said as soon as she came, she realised how, if you like, powerful the Buddhist centre was because as soon as she walked over the threshold, she felt different. She felt in an atmosphere of love, of support, of kindness, because of course the environment she was in, many people are very worried about their future, there's a lot of tension, a lot of fear, and when people are in that sort of state, they can be quite unpleasant to one another. And I found that very, uh, uh, just very moving and, and really reminded me of why it's important to have these very spaces, these environments which can support us. It can be very hard when you take up uh, Buddhist training, when you take up meditation. Uh, you, you, you set off full of enthusiasm and um, you do your daily meditation practice, you do your mindfulness of breathing, you do your metta bhavna and you, know, you notice some changes and you start realising that you want to communicate rather differently with people. You, you, you're getting less cynical, you're being more uh, you know, positive, constructive. You even start becoming vegetarian, <coughs> having you know, a, a simpler life. You, you don't go clubbing so much, <laughs> as you do. You, know, you don't go down to the pub so much. You, you want to go to bed early so you can get up and, and meditate. <laughs> you, know, you find that, that perhaps the people around you in, in work environments and perhaps even friends, perhaps even family, um, just, just aren't very supportive. And it, it can be very, very jarring. You're changing your consciousness, and yet you're bumping up against quite, quite challenging conditions. It's not that the people around you are bad or evil or anything like that, but they're not doing what you're doing. And in a way, that makes it very clear why we need... This word new society is, is slightly clunky, but why we need environments which are really supportive of our practice. It doesn't mean that we're just hothouse flowers, that you know, we can only grow in the Buddhist greenhouse and you know, take us out, we're going to die in the, in, in the, in the winter, in, you know, in the cold winter desert of ordinary life. Um, it's just sensible. It's just sensible. You know, we, we, you know, we do operate in 
the world, so to speak. We can't avoid it. That's, that's our territory. But you need to be in places which support you so that when you move into different environments with different people, you can actually move into those environments with strength and where you can have a very, very positive effect on the people around you. And of course, but you notice this as well, that uh, you know, sometimes people notice something in your workplace or something like that. They notice something different about you. Uh, and, you know, they, they, they might come up, you, 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 you know, you've got a new partner or something, or, <laughs> no, you know, or, or, there's something going on. And you have to sort of, you, you start saying, well, actually, I, I, I've become a bit of a Buddhist and <laughs> I do a bit of meditation. Now, I thought there was something. You know, and, and they get interested and, and, you know, you even get, I know, in workplaces, little meditation groups and clubs and things like that. Well, this is, this is the way the sort of new society, to use that language, works. It's about people. It's about people communicating, people exemplifying, people living a life which transmits something. And of course, when you get people together doing that, they tend to want to create things out of that. This Buddhist centre has come out of people uh, practising Buddhism together, sharing their lives together, and that emerging into bricks and mortar. Um, you know, some affairs come out of people. That's, that's how they arise. So all these things are tremendously important. In a way, it's just a very, very simple point. That, that Buddhism, for you, you might think that the image of Buddhism is the solitary sage, the hermit, uh, something like that. And of course, you do get solitary sages and hermits in Buddhist tradition. But Buddhism is, is very social as well. It has a very, very strong social uh, dimension. Uh, it is about people. Uh, it is about loving kindness. It is about compassion and sympathetic joy and other social emotions. It is about speech, speaking well, about being with uh, people and people being together and creating something new and being a source and force of inspiration uh, for others. And I think it's very important to remember that. I think the image of Buddhism in the West very often is of the solitary, uh, the solitary meditator. And it might even be that, that people come to Buddhism and come to meditation because they want that. They want to kind of get away from the stresses and strains, quite rightly. They want to relax, they want to relieve all that tension. That's a very, very good thing. There's so much tension and stress in life. And that's, that's a good start, but it's only a start. And if you really want to push on in Buddhist practice, you have to start emerging into, yes, yes, being able to handle deeper and greater solitude and uh, solitary meditative experience, but also learning to be with others in an entirely different way. And this, this whole uh, way of looking at things is reflected in the Buddha's enlightenment itself. We had Buddha Day recently, uh, where we celebrated uh, the enlightenment of the Buddha, um, his liberation uh, from the whole of conditioned and constructed existence, his liberation from all limiting habitual tendencies, his liberation from all ignorance and aversion and craving, his emergence into this boundless <coughs> Well, you can call it consciousness if you like, but that doesn't really say what it is at all. This boundless state, freedom is the best word. Uh, this, this state of inconceivable liberation. Um, but what happens after that, that sort of incredible breakthrough, unprecedented breakthrough, he has all sorts of uh, absorptions underneath, they're represented as being underneath different trees that the Enlightenment happens under what's known as the Bodhi tree, but there's all sorts of experience under, experiences under different trees, sort of meditative experiences, contemplative experiences. Uh, but there's one where he has his first encounter after Enlightenment, and it's a very significant encounter. He's under the goat herd's banyan tree, as it's called. <coughs> Banyan's absolutely wonderful trees, huge trees with these 
roots that come down from their branches. Very, very shady, wonderful, huge trees. So he's beneath this tree called the goat herds man, presumably because goat herds ha hung out there. And you have to remember that don't, don't think of the Buddha as looking like this. Uh, don't think of him as, as wearing neatly pressed robes. He would have been wearing a rag, you know, rag clothing, uh, discoloured, probably lovely, you know, earthy ochre colour. He would have been very, very lean, uh, might have been unshaven, um, had a, you know, having a very fashionable sort of style. Um, <laughs> his hair might have been quite long, actually. He'd been doing a lot of ascetic practice. Um, and it said under these, these different trees, he sat for seven days and seven nights, not unusual, um, in the bliss of liberation, just enjoying the bliss that comes from that liberation, from all limitation. Uh, it's very important, you know, you don't have to do anything with enlightenment. Uh, you can just enjoy the bliss of liberation, you don't have to kind of you know, run around, and, you know, it's, it's not that the Buddha felt compelled to do anything at all, you know, it's like he's a sphere, perfectly poised, that can go in any direction, and he enjoys the bliss of liberation, and he emerges, and somebody comes along, and the somebody that comes along is described as a Brahmin, so a Brahmin is from the so-called priestly caste, regarded as the highest caste in in Brahminical uh, Indian society, so this is uh, the, the you know the, the the top kind of person in Indian life at that time, and this uh, Brahmin is described as a as a hunkara, uh, a, hu a hunkara Brahmin. That means he has faith in the mantra hu, but other translators say he 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 just was very grumpy and conceited, <laughs> so he keeps making the noise. <laughs> <laughs> you can, it seems to be a bit of a joke going on in the, in the Pali Canon here, that, that chanting, you know, a mantra, a Brahminical mantra is the same as going, <laughs> like that, but anyway, you know, we have very little jokes in these texts. And he comes along and he's, you know, he's obviously heard about this holy man in the forest, and he says to, he, to the Buddha, what makes a Brahmin? What makes a Brahmin? Now this is a really interesting question because the Brahmin is, in that society, is regarded as the, the highest man. The highest man by virtue of his birth into the Brahmin caste. And the Buddha's reply is really strong. He, he doesn't say, well, there is, I don't believe in caste or anything like that. He doesn't do that. He gives a completely different, different definition. He said a Brahmin, essentially, he says, a Brahmin has got nothing to do with birth. The highest kind of man has got nothing to do with the family you're born in. Uh, the, 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 the highest man is dependent, it, it's how he lives. What are his morals? What is his understanding? What is his character? What is his purity? Uh, in other words, he's saying you, you become that highest person by virtue of your ethics, by virtue of your meditation, by virtue of your wisdom. In other words, it's to do with your, the transformation of your character. And the Brahmin goes off, he, there's no, he doesn't seem to appear again in the scriptures, he just goes off. But it's a very significant encounter, and when you go to Bodh Gaya, you can see the place where this happened. And it's a very significant place, because it, 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 one of the things that it's communicated is that the Buddha's enlightenment has an immediate relationship with the social structure of India. Not just a relationship, it has an immediate critique of it. In other words, Buddhism is revolutionary. The Buddha's enlightenment is revolutionary. It's got something to say, it's got something to do with the a, a repressive structures of what uh, great Dr. Ambedkar, great leader of uh, the Dalit community, the Buddhist community in, in India, called the graded system of inequality. Buddhism has something to say in relation to that. So it's hugely significant. And for 
Dalit Buddhists in India, Buddhists who come from a Dalit background, this moment in the Buddha's uh, life stories of, of extraordinary significance. They sometimes say that this is where what they call the Dhamma revolution, the Buddhist revolution, begins in India, straight after the Buddha's enlightenment. And it's, it's so interesting when you think about it. The Buddha, in it, from a certain point of view, the Buddha and his wandering disciples, they sort of don't care about society. They are kind of dropouts. Um, to use a very old-fashioned expression, you know, they, they have, you know, what is it? They have turned on and tuned in and dropped out, as, as it was put many years ago for those old hippies amongst you. Not through taking NSD or anything like that, but through ecstatic meditation practice. In a sense, they're not bothered. They, they're, not, um, they're not sort of busybodies concerned with sort of social activism in that way and telling us how to live and moralising us about, about how we live. Their, their only concern is liberation. You know, the Buddha was part of a wider community known as the Shramanas, sort of freelance wanderers, uh, wandering around northern India at that time, very experimental, very concerned with, uh, you know, living a very, very full life, completely devoted to individual transformation. And they, they'd just given up on the world around them. They were free to do that. It was a very enlightened society, smallly, from that point of view, that, that, that particular period in India at, at that time. But on the other hand, presented with a person, presented with people, the Buddha's enlightenment cuts through any sense of conceit uh, any artificial ideas of where you stand in relation to others in society, which is what the caste system is. It's an entirely artificial way of stratifying uh, people. And uh, cutting through uh, to the human, cutting through to the human, I think this is you know, the really crucial thing if we're going to talk about Buddhism's impact uh, on the world. Buddhism is about human beings in the profoundest uh, sense. And it's interesting to see where the, where the Buddha goes after his enlightenment, in a way this, uh, you know, if we're, we're, we're following the festivals, we're between now uh, the Buddha's enlightenment and the next big festival, which is Dharma Day, where he first teaches uh, the Dharma. And he, he, he teaches uh, some old friends of his who, who, were, who, were, who were practicing asceticism with him, who were wanderers like himself. That's the first group he goes to. But the next group he goes to, and, it, and it's almost arbitrary how it, how it happens, it's really a bunch of playboys. It's a, it's a, bunch, of, a bunch of guys who, who are merchant sons from the great, great city of, uh, of Benares. And, and you know, they've they, they just led dissolute, thoroughly spoiled, dissolute lives. I mean, they're the last people you'd think would be interested in following the Buddhist life. But somehow or other, the Buddha connects. He connects with them deeply, profoundly. You know, when the Buddha sees people, he doesn't go on outward appearance. Oh, that person looks like a spiritual person. Oh, that looks like a religious person. I'll connect with them. He's not interested in any of that outward show. He connects with the person with the human. I mean, the, the, the second group among those playboys, they were, they were wandering around this park where the Buddha was sitting because they'd been ripped off by um, a courtesan who they'd taken to this park for some fun and games. And the courtesan had just nicked all their money and ornaments. Quite good on, good on it, I say. <laughs> um, and they were really upset. You know, they were really fed up. You know, they'd lost everything, and what are mum and dad going to think, you know, and, and somehow the Buddha uses that to connect. He's not interested in moralising with them about what they've been up to. He actually connects with, with them at a meaningful level. So this is it, 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 what I'm trying to illustrate here, that the Buddha's teaching cuts across any kind of artificial strati stratification. Enlightenment is... Uh, for everybody. Enlightenment, and in that way, enlightenment has powerful 
is a powerful social revolutionary force. There isn't a type of person who becomes a Buddhist. There isn't a type of person who takes up meditation. I think this is really important because I think sometimes people think, oh, Buddhists, Western Buddhists especially, they must be a kind of university educated, white middle class intellectual types. And um, that is just rubbish. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just so limited. Buddhism is for everybody because Buddhism is for human beings primarily. Uh, whatever their background, uh, whatever, their, whatever their conditioning, whatever their gender, whatever their class background, uh, whatever their political interests, this is really, really important that we get hold of this. I think it's very important that Buddhists really get hold of this. And sometimes in our own uh, Buddhist community, you get fallings out between people over political allegiances. Well, the Buddha must have been a card-carrying Labour Party member. <laughs> <laughs> must have been. You know, I've seen. No, absolutely not. Absolutely no interest whatsoever in anything like that. And it's sort of shameful when you get Buddhists falling out over political party political matters. We've got to actually go much deeper than that. We've got something even more radical uh, to do in relation to that. There is a Buddhist perspective on these things, uh, but the, it's not easy to find it. And you have to work very, very hard to get to it. One of the things I think is tremendously important about, about um, going back to this point about the human one of the things I've been noticing recently is how ideology is poisoning human relationships. Ideology is poisoning human relationships. Even people convinced that their ideology is the best expression of the human is actually used to punish and to block communication with other human beings. And I think, we, I think ideology is so pernicious very, very tightly held dogmas about what life is and what life is for. I can understand why we have it, why we grab at ideologies, because we do have a crisis of meaning. I think if we're talking about new society, social revolution, profound change in the world around us, we have to address the issue of meaning. What, what is life actually for? What is it about? That seems to be the major crisis that people are facing. What gets you out of bed in the morning? Is it really to check Twitter? <laughs> to check your Facebook account? To check the latest in the soap opera of the BBC News site? A um, bit better if you're checking the sports pages. <laughs> Bit of a confession there. <laughs> um, I mean, even worse if it's the entertainment pages. I mean, celebrity gossip or whatever it might be. I mean, I do have Buddhist friends who love all that, but <laughs> is that really what's getting you out, uh, out of bed in the morning? Really making your your life worthwhile, uh, even though it might be incredibly worthy? Is that what this is for? I mean, you can tell it's a problem. You know, if you have trouble with your computer or you know, connecting or something like that, the crisis that you then get into, you know, you can't function properly. Well, hey, there's a, you know, your meaning, therefore, is entirely dependent on external conditions. Is that the kind of meaning uh, that we want? So we need to talk about meaning. What does it mean to be a human being? What, what is this precious human existence really for? You know, if we're going to talk about uh, human transformation, we have to ask ourselves, what is this for? Unlimited economic growth so that you know, we can get that book the next day on Amazon Prime? Really? Is that paradise? Is that what this is for? Um, you know, I remember with the fall of the, you know, with the fall of the, um, the you know, the, 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 communi the fall of communism, the communist states, and you know, everybody thought how wonderful that was, world peace is going to happen, and all the rest of it. And I remember the great cultural critic George Steiner saying, I mean, is this really the future? Burger King from Vladivostok to Hawaii, is that actually 
is that actually what the world is for? Is that really what it's about? So we've got to inquire into meaning. What does it mean to be a human being? What do we need to do with this, <coughs> this precious human life? We need, we need something that's grounded in some kind of truth, the truth that we can actually see, that, that we can rely on, and which we can apply to ourselves. And when you, when you look into it, one of the things that you notice when you look deeply at the nature of life and, and what's going on all around you, uh, when you get down to it, life is, well, it's change. You know, that's very, very obvious. Life is always changing. Um, wonderful summer that's, that's starting to open up. We've moved from one season to another and you can see all that wonderful, you know, uh, efflorescence in, in, in the garden out there. Uh, it's, it's so wonderful. Life is change. Life is actually growth. Um, there is this whole notion of, of evolution. You know, we've arrived at our humanity on the back of tremendous sorts of forces of, of change and, and growth. We actually have to live, therefore, in accordance with that growth and change. But the thing is about being human, we've been delivered with a mind. We've actually been delivered with a highly developed consciousness. Uh, we don't always realise that, but we have this extraordinary consciousness that has a special quality of being able to reflect on experience. Uh, it, it, it can be a sort of double-edged sword, because if that reflection on experience is in the grip of intense craving or hatred, we can become extremely, uh, uh, we can do so much damage to, to ourselves and especially to other people. But on the other hand, this reflexive consciousness can enable us to move beyond what we've been given. Move beyond what we've been given. We need to change. We need to, because we are beings of change. We need to grow because we are beings of growth. And if we don't live in accordance with a different kind of evolving, a different kind of growth, the result of that is pain. I'd even go so far as to say it can even result in highly destructive activity. If you repress or suppress the growth in yourself or others, that energy of change isn't going to go down quietly. It's very interesting, our teacher Sangharachita, who's really reflected on these themes a lot, in one of his lectures, was even going so far, went as far as to say that, that, that if you don't respond to the challenge of developing and growing yourself, or if that's blocked by the world around you, that could even become destructive criminal activity. He wasn't saying all crime necessarily is a result of that, but I thought it was a powerful insight. And I used to see this in India, uh, because I lived in India for many years with those communities that were deemed uh, untouchable by the caste system who converted to Buddhism. And many of them, many of my friends who are now order members, came from very, well, criminal backgrounds, criminal backgrounds. They were involved in very, power, very uh, violent um, uh, political uh, groupings of one kind or another, or just low-level criminal activity in the slums of Pune and Bombay and places like that. And then and talking to them, you know, I wanted to know, well, why? What was this? And they, they said, well, there was no possibility of growth. Getting an education was really very, very difficult. Getting a decent job, which would usually mean a government job, they didn't have the money to pay the bribes. So there's this constant denial of, of, of just growth on an ordinary human level. And they said when they discovered the Dharma, when they discovered Buddhist practice, and the whole possibility of really taking hold of their life, really developing themselves, even though there was no change to their economic situation, even though there was no change in, in their circumstances, suddenly they had, they, they got hold of their life. 
they could actually develop themselves. And, and sometimes overnight, there was a move away from, well, alcoholism, uh, various other kinds of addictions, and yes, violent criminal activity. And I was very, very struck by that. Very, very struck by that. The sheer power of giving people meaning, giving people a path, showing what is possible as a human being in terms of you can actually develop and move out beyond yourself, beyond your self-definition and the definition that's given to you by the world around you. Very powerful and revolutionary. Not, I should just say, through, you know, hearing talks like this, you know, through a lot of rhetoric. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's easy to sort of talk up, you know, loving your neighbour as yourself and, you know, all that sort of thing. But you actually need tools. You actually need things to, to enact meaning uh, in yourself. And the most powerful uh, tool initially, and it's not the only tool, is meditation. Is meditation. Uh, meditation is the first, in a sense, revolutionary act, and I'm using the word act deliber deliberately, uh, even though it's involving the mind, as far as Buddhism is going to be concerned, the Buddha is concerned, mind is action. Mind, it's as powerful, if not more powerful, than verbal action, because speech is an action, and overt physical action. Uh, this is something, again, that we uh, perhaps just don't take seriously enough. We don't realise how powerful mind is. Perhaps the word mind isn't a good word for whatever mind is. Um, it's too mental. And, um, you know, we don't, in a way, take thought that seriously. Uh, you know, you get various terms for, for mind in Buddhism, but chitta is probably the most important here, which also means heart. Um, it means will, it means volition, has all these meanings. In, in uh, Hindu tradition it's also translated as soul. It is a bit uncomfortable with the word soul because it can sound like something fixed and unchanging. But at least it gives the sense of some, some powerful inner drive. That's what we're really talking about. And one of the first things you, you do to, to, to practice what we call in India the Dhamma Revolution is to really work on your mind and realise how powerful mind is. I mean, there's a whole uh, tradition in Buddhism, the Yogacara tradition, which say, speaks of mind as go, having enormous depths, enormous depths to it. It's not just the thoughts rattling through you know, our brain or something like that. They, they talk about that what's really, in a sense, running the show is what they call the Alia Vignana, the storehouse uh, consciousness, that basically all of our volitional acts of body, speech and mind are affecting us. Skillful acts of body, speech and mind, you know, acts which are made up of love and generosity and contentment and wisdom, they're having a very powerful effect that we're not even aware of. It's, it, they're, they're sort of affecting this deep consciousness, depositing seeds in this deep consciousness. But equally, our unskillful actions of body, speech and mind, actions made up of greed, hatred and delusion and their ugly brothers and sisters, they're also sowing seeds in this, in this deep uh, consciousness, which is described as a river, a torrent that's sort of flowing on. And as you go on in your life, there are certain times where the effects of your actions flare up. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. There's been things you've been doing, material that you've been entertaining, and you think you're going to get away with it, and then suddenly a whole set of conditions come about, and to your horror, all of that sort of secret life, perhaps, is suddenly blasting in front of you, and you realise the mess that you've made, because you haven't taken seriously what you're doing. You haven't taken seriously the effects of your actions on the depths of your mind. And equally, let's, let's not just be negative, let's be positive. You know, sometimes, you know, in Buddhist practice, you meditate every day, you do that mindfulness of breathing, you do that metabhavna, you don't think you're getting any, anywhere, 
And then one day, whether you're on the meditation cushion or you're off your cushion, suddenly you're, you're into another kind of consciousness. It's very open, it's very loving, it's very clear, you're seeing into things, you're, you're acting smoothly, you're interacting with other people really well. Well, that's because your actions are having consciousness, uh, having, having effects on your deep level of consciousness. So, meditation is very, very powerful. Again, Dr. Ambedkar, this great leader, who was the first law minister in the government in, of India who framed the constitution, uh, the great leader of, of, of Buddhists uh, in India, he, he thought that the great, this was the great insight of the Buddha, the, the power of mind, the power of mind. And his point was that if you take up a practice, you take up a religion which makes the mind the individual mind that you take responsibility for, if you take that up, that will guarantee not just your own change, but the change in the world around you. You get enough people working on their mind, working on their consciousness, bringing about what the Yogacara call the revolution in the base, which is not a reggae trap, but <laughs> <laughs> the base of consciousness, bringing about that revolution then you can guarantee real, real transformation, real change uh, in society. Obviously, meditation isn't enough in itself. That's then got to start translating into your communication with other people, into your interactions with other people. And it's, it, for me, the most important meditation for this reason Mindfulness of breathing, it's really important. I don't want to <coughs> underestimate the mindfulness of breathing at all. But for me, the most powerful practice is metabhavna. That's the one that people have a lot of difficulty with. But the whole point of metabhavna, the reason why this is a revolutionary practice, is precisely because other people are in it. Um, precisely because other people are in it. In that meditation, you're learning to not, you're learning to see through the illusion of a separate consciousness, a separate self and other. That's the basic delusion. This whole idea that we are separated out uh, from other people. That's the fundamental delusion that we have a fixed, permanent, separate self here and other people are just over there. What you're doing in Metabhavna, you're learning to imaginatively embrace others imaginatively, uh, if, if you like, practice this, uh, this, this powerful identification with others. There are some descriptions of this meditation where you, 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 you try to, it's, it's a bit like Keats's, those who know their romantic poetry, a negative <laughs> capability. You're trying to sort of sus negative in the sense of suspending your own ego assertion and learning how to be capable of experiencing another through your imagination. You know what it's like to experience yourself. You know what you want in life. You want to be happy. You want to avoid suffering. You want to be protected. You want to be treated well. That's what we want. That's, that's how we do it. Other people are exactly the same. They're, they're no different from you in any way whatsoever. So you learn to embrace, to become the other. Um, and this is taken uh, to profound degrees. You learn to embrace, in the fourth stage of that meditation, the person you hate, or the person who hates you. Uh, sometimes people say, well, I don't hate anybody. I, I, I love everybody. And uh, we sometimes say, uh, anybody in your family? And <laughs> <laughs> you see the sort of horror from their face. <laughs> Uh, Donald Trump, uh, you know, and again you say, I've got to love Donald Trump. <laughs> yes, he needs our compassion. <laughs> of course he does. Um, but, but, but yes, you, have, you, you learn to expand your, your range. And then of course, that's got to start turning into actual deeds. And here, the Sangha, the spiritual community, comes into its own. The beautiful thing about the Sangha as a sort of nucleus of a new society 
is that you end up being with people in a sangha who you wouldn't choose to be with, who you'd usually avoid. I mean, this is the, the, the most annoying practice of, of, of Buddhism. Um, you're suddenly with somebody and you, you realise that you can't bear them. You absolutely can't bear them. They're a Buddhist. You can see that. There's absolutely no doubt that they love the Buddhist practice, they meditate like you, they're an ethical person, they're a decent person, they're kind to people, they're meditating and all the rest of it. You just can't stand them. <laughs> you know, you know, when they speak, your, your teeth go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you know, I, I've had this experience. I mean, I, I can think of people who I've really managed to kind of dodge in my Buddhist life, and I've had a quite long Buddhist life. <laughs> and I just kept coming. There was one particular person. I, I met them early on when I was a youngster, and I couldn't stand them then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said, come on, you're a Buddhist, you've got to love everybody. And then I, so, I, you know, I worked and worked and worked on that. So then I managed to get away from them. <laughs> and then, and there they were again. You know, I even moved to India. And they were there. <laughs> and then I moved somewhere else and I ended up living with them and being in an order chapter with them. And what was even more annoying was that my Buddhist friends, who, you know, who, are, who I loved, they said, well, yeah, I can see what you mean about it, but I, think I don't have those kinds of responses. <laughs> yeah, but can't you see? <laughs> but then we start realising, hang on, this isn't actually to do with them. Whatever's going on with them, this is my reaction. This is my reaction. This, is, this person, actually, I hate to admit it, they are my greatest friend because they're showing me my fundamental reactions to others. And this is the brilliant thing about spiritual community. Because you can be involved in sort of all sorts of constructive social activity, social change, but you might never have this experience because you're never that long with somebody, you're never that close uh, to somebody. But in a Sangha, you, 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 you have it very, very strongly and you've got the possibility there of transforming things on a very deep level. Um, and you, you might even be able to work with them on it. So you're learning to become more robust with your loving kindness, more, um, you know, more, uh, more, more able to uh, um, overcome uh, your aversion to not, and your ill will, and to be in all kinds of challenging and difficult situations. So meditation, and then ethical practice, being together with other Buddhists, are very, very pr powerful practices, practices to bring about social change and social transformation. It's a, it's a huge task for us, a huge task for us, and I think it's very, very important to, 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 to have a proper kind of humility about this sort of area. It's very easy to talk about these things in, you know, in a wonderful place like this. Um, but when I was, uh, you know, when I, I, I got involved with the Dharma when I was quite young, and I was ordained when I was still uh, a teenager, when I was 19. And quite early on I started to take meditation classes in London and take Buddhist courses and things like that in North London and West London. And, you know, I was quite good at giving Buddhist talks. And I eventually ended up going to India in the late 1970s. Uh, not on the hippie trail or anything like that. I went to work for Buddhism. Uh, because a very close friend of mine, a man named Lokamitra, was starting Buddhist activities with the so-called ex-untouchable Buddhists who were old disciples of our teacher, particularly in Pune. And we're talking about thousands and thousands of people embracing Buddhism from, from the Dalit community, from the downtrodden community, as a way of liberation, a way of social liberation, even political liberation, and spiritual liberation. Um, following their great leader, Dr. Ambedkar. So I was doing, again, lots of taking meditation classes, being involved with retreats, giving Dharma talks in, in, you know, in these, in, you know, this, this uh, 
very particular context. And of course, Buddhism had to be socially re relevant. It was very powerful training for me because I was used to talking in a way more psychologically about Buddhist practice in London. Here, I was in a different situation, which was much more real, if you like, uh, much more real. And I remember one, on one occasion, um, a real, an incredibly humbling uh, moment. Um, we used to have this, we had wonderful classes. We didn't have a centre then, we just had used people's houses, you know, we'd go to Hutman colonies, we'd, you know, borrow, you know, deserted buildings to, to hold meditation classes and so on and so forth. We, you know, borrow places for retreats. And we had a wonderful little sangha uh, developing, you know, the whole kind of basis for what is now a very big part of our order in India. And one evening I went to uh, my usual meditation class near Pune Station, a uh, very nice family who would uh, we'd do the class and then the, the uh, ladies of the house would make sure I had a really good meal afterwards and they made sure I was very well fed. Um, and this day was the, was the 6th of December and the 6th of December is a very important day for Buddhists and uh, ex-untouchable people because it's the death day of Dr. Ambedkar, the great leader. And uh, in those days, in Pune, I don't know if it's still the same, there would be speeches at uh, near Pune railway station in a garden where there was a statue of Dr. Ambedkar, not far from Pune police station, the collector's office, um, old India hands will know what I'm talking about. And um, it's, it, they were, I wasn't involved in the speeches. Uh, I wasn't, you know, we, uh, probably if I'd gone back there years later, I would have been asked to speak, but I was just a little boy in those days. Um, but um, something had happened uh, at the event. Uh, the police had done what they call a lati charge, that is our very, very heavy bamboo canes. And uh, they'd uh, killed uh, men, women and children through their beatings and hospitalised many. Nobody knows why it happened. There wasn't a demonstration. They just did it, you know, and you have to understand that, that certainly in those days the police could be very, very antagonistic towards uh, the Dalit community. Um, and people came into the class after that. Or I'd either been there or they'd heard about it because the word had gone round very, very demoralised, very, very demoralised. And uh, a, a good friend of mine, a woman friend of mine, said straight out, what can your Metta Bhavana do in relation to this? What can your Metta Bhavana, your loving kindness meditation, do in relation to this? You know, it was one of those moments like, hang on, this has just got real. This has just got real. This is Buddhism right in the front line. And I have to admit, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. I didn't have so much experience. I felt incredibly out of my depth uh, in relation to that. Um, and I said, well, let's just, let's just sit together. Let's just sit in silence together. Let's not, let's not talk tonight about the Dharma. Let's not have any teaching. Let's just sit and be together. And we sat and we were together and, you know, things, you know, sort of changed and, and it was summer. Um, but, but then we had a meal together and, uh, you know, things moved on. And it didn't deflect, you know, overall what we were trying to do. All those people who were involved with us, you know, redoubled their efforts to practice the Dharma together and to build something out of that. But it really, really struck me. It really, really struck me how Buddhist practice does have to face things like this. As a Buddhist, we do have to do that. We do have to be in relationship to things like violence, to oppression. We do have to make sure that our practice is always reaching the human and is not deflected by anything that dehumanizes. We have to develop I, it, the, the, what came out of that for me. I felt humbled, I felt almost ashamed really that I didn't have the 
the depth of response that I felt I needed to have. But I learned on that occasion, my practice has to become diamond hard to be able to be in relationship to people in this situation. And I have to say that, you know, over the years, because I kept going back to India, I uh, did a lot of work in many, for over many years in Bombay. And I think I can say that, 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 I, I, that me and uh, the, the group of people I was involved with had a tremendous effect, you know, on a wide range of people in terms of giving them meaning, giving them meaning, giving them a moral compass, giving them a practice. The number of people who came to me with alcoholic pasts, and it was all to do with no meaning, working in dead-end jobs, you know, being close to, to poverty, uh, having to travel, you know, two hours to and from work on the, the, the terrible Bombay local train service and, you know, the municipal buses and so on and so forth. Well, what are you going to do when you get back at night to your slum? You're just going to hammer yourself with country liquor. I mean, why not? You know, and, uh, you know, what is the meaning of this life? And the number of times people would say to me, actually, learning meditation, learning how to really live a Buddhist life has changed all that. I feel more optimistic. I feel I have a, a group, a community of friends now. I feel we're doing something together to actually bring about a change and a transformation around me. And over the years, we were able in India to develop environments like this, to build centres, to bring people together so that there is real strength in community. It's not just, I mean, it's very easy in a sense to talk about India and the transformation of society there, but of course it's exactly the same here. There are so many people alienated from human life. I had a walk into Sheffield today, into, into the city centre. I love Sheffield, I love coming to Sheffield, I really connected to the city, but I found it sad. Um, I felt a bit sad, I, it, it felt a little bit shabby, shabbier than when I first came to Sheffield. Uh, I presume that's to do with cuts, and walking through, walking down Division Street and you know, walking into the city centre, there seemed to be a lot of weird people, a lot of very alienated people, um, in quite strange states. Um, you know, I don't, I mean, I hope it wasn't me who was weird and strange. I felt normal. I felt, well, not that I don't actually feel normal, but you know what I mean. You know, people, you know, a number of people I passed, they were obviously suffering. And they, they didn't quite know they were suffering. Their faces were tight and tense. And I, and I was thinking about this, thought, well, we, we have to reach these people. We have to reach these people. And I, I always go to the Graves Art Gallery. I, always go, I love the Graves. I love, I love, there's always a little gem in there. I didn't have my very favourite painting they have in there, Landscape by David Bomberg. But they did have a Stanley Spencer, Helter Skelter, which is fantastic. But I noticed that the paint was coming off the walls. You know, this wonderful institution, a library, an art gallery, you know, a, a human space, you know, where people can learn and appreciate beauty. And of course, hardly anybody there. I found, I found that really tragic. And I thought, well, as Buddhists, we've got to support things like that, those sorts of spaces. And of course, we have to create our own spaces where people can come together and experience themselves as human beings in the fullest sense. That's, that's what we have to do. Thank goodness it's happening. It could happen more, but it is actually happening. And the Buddhist Centre is an important part of, 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 of Sheffield. You know, so many people come here and uh, benefit from it. But we have to strengthen that. And it's really up to the individual efforts of, our, of us all to strengthen it through living meaningfully, full meaning, recognising our humanity strengthening that, developing that, particularly through meditation, through the revolutionary act of meditation, expressing that in our communication uh, with one another, uh, developing that through, you know, really enriching and developing environments like this. So that's my little ramble, uh, the Daniel, on 
some of the themes you mentioned to me. Um, I can only hope that it was good. <laughs>